Anybody can uh, end the meeting whenever they feel uh, hurt, you know. I guess these would be very long meetings, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I think it looks like the numbers have leveled off now. Um, and we're anyway a couple of minutes already past five. Uh, past five in Europe and past, I, know, I don't know, past uh, nine in California and uh, six in Israel. So uh, let's just start. It's uh, great to see so many of you again joining. We uh, again reach uh, participant numbers of more than 100. That's fantastic, even after one year of this webinar uh, running. And of course, it gives me particular pleasure to introduce uh, Kristen Linda Larson as our speaker today. Great to have you, Kristen. And I think uh, almost everybody in the audience will be familiar with Creston and this work. And I think actually it's very hard to work in the field of molecular biophysics without having encountered uh, Creston's work. Um, I would say in summary, uh, his work basically bridges the gap between, um, let's say experimental structural biology and protein dynamics on one hand side and molecular dynamics simulations on the other hand. Um, with the big overarching goal, of course, to understand better proteins and particularly their functions. And um, this interest in combining experiments and simulations already started early on in his career. So already during his PhD, he used the combination of NMR spectroscopy um, and molecular, dynam uh, uh, molecular dynamics simulations to um, understand and retrieve protein structure and dynamics for ubiquitin and over the past 15 years. He really expanded this idea to many other proteins, most prominent among them um, IDPs. And uh, certainly everybody will remember his seminal work about 12 years ago with the research and the Anton supercomputer that gave the first millisecond molecular dynamic simulations of protein folding reactions for WW domain and BPTI. And a year later, um, for 12 different proteins, similarly long trajectories that uh, till today are a gold mine for theoreticians that ask questions such as what are good reaction coordinates? Can we at all describe folding as a diffusive process along one coordinate or is this just too far fetched? Now, since then, um, Keston has really been at the forefront of developing and optimizing force fields and always very carefully benchmarking um, those force fields uh, with experimental data from NMR, from SACS, from neutron scattering. And of course, also uh, developing um, optimization and comparison methods such as Bayesian uh, maximum entropy methods. And uh, on top of this more method oriented work, he always found time to ask important biological questions. Uh, for example, um, how is allostery working in proteins? How can kinases access recognition motifs that are buried within folded proteins and that certainly require some sort of dynamics in order to get accessible? Um, worked on co-chaperones, chaperones, and I think a very strong current part of his research is to combine high throughput experimental methods also from cell biology with data science in order to address problems in genomic medicine. Now, a few words about his CV. Kresten did his PhD with Chris Dobson in, uh, in Cambridge University, and then almost immediately after went to the University of Copenhagen as an assistant professor. However, apparently it was very tempting for him to do a postdoc, particularly with uh, D. Shaw uh, research. And so um, he went for a couple of years to New York, and I think that was certainly a very good decision, and then returned as an assistant uh, associate professor back to Copenhagen in 2011. And naturally, um, Preston received many awards and accolades, uh, for example, from the Danish Independent Research Council. He received the Gordon Bell Prize and a number of extremely prestigious multi-million dollar grants from the Novo Nordisk Foundation, Lundbeck Foundation, and many more. And so um, it really gives us a particular pleasure to have him today. So thanks a lot for joining, Creston. But before I hand over the stage to you, um, I would like to uh, uh, say that our webinar really lives from vivid discussions. And so please, if you encounter a question during Creston's talk, uh, type in question in the chat window. I will call you one by one. It's always better if you ask a question in person. Um, but of course, if you don't have a microphone, just 
type in your question and I will read it, but uh, preferably ask your question in, pers uh, in person. We never stop the time. You can also ask two questions. And so typically our, our discussion uh, is about 20 to 30 minutes. So it can be really intensive. And so finally, I would also like to announce uh, the speaker of our next webinar, which is going to be in three weeks from now, not in two weeks. This just has some uh, organizational uh, reasons. And so on November 22nd, Helmut Grubmiller is, uh, uh, is going to talk uh, most likely about um, his recent work on, on cryo-electron microscopy and, and cooling effects um, in structures uh, determined with cryo-EM. But um, now um, I'm happy to hand over the stage to Kristen. Uh, Kristen, I stop sharing and uh, please share. Thank you very much, Hagen. And thank you all for coming. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, I apologize already up front that there won't be any protein folding. Uh, as you mentioned, we are working on trying to use biophysical methods to interpret genomic variation. Um, but I decided to talk about uh, something else today. Now I have to figure out how to do something that just popped up on my screen here. Great. So instead, what I'll talk about is very much you know, following on what, what, what Hagen talked about uh, on integrating experiments and, and, and simulations. And I'll talk about uh, three things that are, you know, at least to some extent, uh, connected. Uh, the first part is about how we can use experimental data to, uh, uh, to correct or to construct uh, ensembles uh, and sort of uh, although most of what I'll talk about is disordered proteins and, and, and multi-domain proteins with disordered parts, there will be a sort of a small side story on some, 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 some actual normal protein dynamics. Um, and then I'll talk briefly about some work that we've been doing on trying to use experimental data to tweak a force field. Uh, and then in the last part, I'll talk most about how we can use experimental data maybe to parameterize a, a large part of a, of a coarse grain uh, model. Um, so before I do that, I'll just give a brief introduction. I'll, I'll say that most of what I'll talk about will be sort of relatively methods oriented um, in the sense that we'll talk about sort of methods to do various things and not go into sort of much biology or actually maybe not even so much detailed biophysics, but at least give you a flavor of some of the things that we think are important and what, you know, what are fruitful combinations of experiments and simulations. Um, and so we roughly uh, divide up our work and, and, and maybe many of the, your work also in sort of two, 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 two ways of, of linking experiments and simulation. Uh, one is sort of what we call forward uh, modeling where we essentially run simulations and have coffee. Uh, and then we want to figure out whether our simulations are reasonable or not. So we calculate experimental observables and we sort of benchmark the simulations against the experiments. Um, but what we also do uh, commonly is that we are sort of faced with some experimental data typically from collaborators and we want to interpret the data and then we and many other people uh, have developed methods for using simulation as an interpretation tool so in that sense we are sort of using the simulations as a way of fitting the data and so we are using model fitting but our models happen to be confirmational examples generated by, by simulations and this is sort of what we call uh, in, in, in inverse modeling. Um, and of course, these two are not completely unrelated. They build on many of the same tools. And in fact, one uh, uh, is particularly useful for figuring out how as good a simulation is. So if you run a simulation, you compare to experiments, you can figure out how good your simulation is. And this, of course, is a good starting point for improving, uh, for example, force fields. Uh, and this slide is sort of meant to illustrate that uh, in this kind of inverse modeling, where we have some sort of data, uh, the, the less data we have, the more we rely on the, on the underlying physical models of force fields. So if we have you know, enormous amount of data from high-res crystallography and our or EM, we don't really need much of a computational model to get high resolution structures. This is sort of illustrated over here on the right. This is what we traditionally would call protein structure determination. And then the opposite end of the scale, maybe over here on the left, if we have a really good model of the physics, we can just plug in the sequence and we can press go on the computer and we can you know, determine the structure or predict the structure you know, just from a, from a good force field, um, but with no experimental data. Um, and then of course, there's all these kind of low resolution data that, you know, is, is, is much of what we and many other people work on. And, and, and the point being that if you have a good physical model, you can supplement it uh, 
with an, a small amount of data and you can sort of push you know the, 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 towards the left uh, in terms of in terms of saying more about complicated system using uh, little data and so improving force fields enables us not just to do predictive modeling but also to do integrative modeling uh, with, with less data um, so if you run a simulation and it doesn't match the experimental data perfectly, and this is still uh, often the case, there's a bunch of solutions and three of them I've listed here. Right? The first one is, you know, you publish your work and, and, and you're honest about the fact that things don't match up perfectly and you move on to the next system and you sort of put a note maybe mentally on, you know, this didn't work as well as we'd hoped. We certainly have plenty of examples of those uh, and I won't talk about this uh, today, uh, instead, I'll talk about the two next points, which is either you can take that data and you can combine it with the with the simulation, and you can refine the examples, you know, specifically using the experimental data. Um, and once you've accumulated enough examples of this, maybe you have enough disagreement between experiment and simulation, and you can use this more directly, sort of, to improve uh, improve the force fields. And this is what I'll talk uh, mostly about. And if we, for, for a second, and I apologies to, uh, to the organizer of this, uh, ignore single molecule experiments, then we should remember that, you know, whenever we care, compare uh, simulations to, to, to experiments, uh, we should remember that nearly all experiments are some sort of example average. Uh, and this is, of course, key to, 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 to include and think about when we, when we either compare directly to the simulations or when we start to bias this, and I, you know, I tend to show this figure just because it illustrates, you know, an important point that you know will be, you know, probably, you know, uh, common ground to, to to all of you, but still I think worth reiterating. Right? And this is if we do a simple experiment in this case, flipping a coin, uh, and, and we put a small vector on our coin and measure sort of spin up and spin down, but right? the average, you know, z component of the vector that we would get, you know, from from repeating this experiment Avogadro's numbers of time would be a, a, a zero vector. And so if you know, my good experimental colleagues come and say, Kristen, I measured you know, the average uh, Z component of, of, of a coin and it's zero, can you tell me the structure of the coin? If I do what, you know, what we would normally do if we do protein structure determination, that we would rotate the coin until we found a structure of the coin that fits the data. And then what we'll end up with is sort of this solution here at the bottom right, which fits the data perfectly. Uh, but it will be obvious to all of you that it's a pretty poor solution. And the mistake that I made was that I misinterpreted this ensemble average experiment as a single molecule experiment. And so, of course, this you know, we have to, to remember. And I'll briefly touch upon you know, one thing where it's a little bit more complicated than this, and that is you know, when, when the actual time scales of the experiments uh, also start to matter. So when we can't just interpret things even as ensemble averages, over static confirmations, but also need to take the time scales into account. And I'll only mention this very briefly. So <clears throat> there are a bunch of different methods to do this. We've outlined many of them in this review that I that I would just highlight to you for those that are into in sort of a, a semi-technical uh, description of, of, of at least many methods in the field. But very roughly, we can put these methods into two different categories. Uh, where we have some sort of force field here that would give us some sort of free energy landscape. And we can sort of either go down the route of putting the experimental data directly in during the sampling so we can bias the sampling to get a new free energy landscape you know, in with, with a modified force field that we can then sample directly. And so we can get observables out that are in agreement with experiment in some sense, or we can do something else uh, which is what I'll mostly talk about, which is that we can just sample the force field as if the experimental data uh, didn't exist, start to analyze it, and then we can what we call reweight at the end, so we can change the populations of the distribution of confirmations we get out at the end uh, to improve agreement of the experiment. And there is a bunch of different ways of doing this, uh, and I'll in particular talk about one uh, one approach that you know that that, that we are using, um, and 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 that has you know been been developed by by, by a number of of people over the years. And you know, the particular flavor that we use is, is called Bayesian vacuum entropy ensemble refinement. It has many different names. Uh, this is our own papers of this. There's related work by many people, in particular Gerhard Hummer, uh, Jürgen Köfinger, Joanne Busi, Michael Lewandowski, and many, many other uh, people. 
Uh, again, much of this is described in this way. What I'll talk about is some, some work in particular driven by, by Sandro Botano when he was in the group. Uh, and, and the idea is pretty simple. Uh, we have some sort of MD simulation that will give us some distribution of confirmations. This would be this red distribution over here. And if we calculate the average of some observable, this would in that case be this red dashed line and compare it to the experiment, which would be this black dashed line, you can see that it doesn't agree. And then the basic idea is that we will modify the distributions we get out from the simulation uh, so that we fit the data. So we sort of effectively moving the red line to the blue line. And the way that we'll do it is by a minimal perturbation of the ensemble of confirmations that we get out from the MD. And you know, schematically, uh, we'll sort of decrease the population of this state and increase the population Hi. of this state. <laughs> there was someone who didn't. OK, thank you. Um, and sort of we'll effectively be moving our calculated average to within error of the experiment. So this can be done in, in, in several different ways. And the way that I, 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 I like to think about it is an optimization problem uh, of this function up here, uh, gamma. Again, this is something, you know, uh, a method that was sort of originally developed by, by Gerhard Hummer, but you know, there's a long history of doing these kind of things in many different areas of science. Um, and, and, and for those who are familiar with this, this you, know, you can think of it in, in, in your own way, but at least uh, for someone maybe you know, with a more chemical or, or physical chemical background, you can think of this function gamma as sort of a free energy. Uh, and it consists of two different terms here, a chi-square term uh, that measures the deviation between experiment and simulation. Uh, so you can think of that as an enthalpy. And then this entropy term, which is an entropy, um, and that calculates sort of the deviation between the conformational ensemble you generate from your MD simulation and the one that you are trying to optimize by changing the weight, and this is represented here by these Ws here, of each confirmation in your ensemble. So we'll be optimizing the weight of each confirmation. Uh, so there can be thousands of these weights. And of course, that you know, puts the risk of overfitting if we just minimize this chi square term. And so we are regularizing the problem by this entropy term over here. And then there is this parameter theta here that plays the role of a, of a temperature that puts the balance between fitting the data and not deviating too much from the prior, which is the, the, the confirmation example generated by the, by the MD, which would in a standard MD simulation just be a normal Boltzmann example, but we can also use biased simulations. So just sort of to give you a flavor of what this method does, I'll just illustrate it here with a sort of a 2D toy system where we can sort of generate some true force field that we wouldn't typically know this would be the gray distribution over here or the marginals shown here on the two dimensional part here. Um, and then we can have some empty force field. This is now illustrated with the red distribution and this empty force field is not perfect. So that if we calculate the average from the empty, this is this red star over here and compare it to some realization of the experiment, this would be this purple point over here. They, 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 don't, they don't agree well with each other. Right? There are certainly differences here beyond uh, what you would get uh, by just considering the experimental noise. And so what we'll do is that we will be optimizing the weight of the samples from, 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 from the imperfect four field of red. And this is illustrated over here where we are sort of optimizing this gamma function at different values of this uh, theta parameter that puts the balance between the two different terms. And one particular way we like to quantify this balance is that we'll calculate the exponential of this entropy that gives us sort of effectively the number of frames in the MD that contributes to the final ensemble. And so if this temperature is very high, that's effectively all of them. So then we are up here at the, of the top right, we are effectively uh, you know, including all the frames of the MD simulation, but with a poor agreement with experiment. And then as we decrease this temperature, we are moving down this line here where we're fitting the data more and more closely, but at the cost of getting rid of some of the frames. So we are effectively fitting the trajectory you know, by removing frames to select out the ones in an ensemble that fits the data. And then you can do a number of different things I won't talk about in detail, but find some balance between keeping enough of your simulation and fitting the data relatively well. And this is described in a number of papers from us and others, how one can do this and the effect of doing this. And then you end up with something that looks like down here where you can see that we've sort of moved you know, to this blue star that's much closer to the experiment. And what you can then see, if you then compare the distributions we get out, this is then you know, either the 2D distribution or the marginals here, and you can see we end up with a confirmation ensemble that is much closer to the truth. This is the true ensemble that we didn't know, but that just gave us our experimental measurement. And so we can effectively get free energy landscapes 
that are some mixture of the free energy landscape sampled by the MD simulation and information probed by the experiment. I can see that there's some lag here on my side. I don't know whether you have a lag on your side also. Uh, doesn't look like we have a lag. Okay, so, good. So, so I'll, I'll just give uh, one, one example here on some recent work uh, that was done uh, in particular by Mustafa Karab, shown here in the middle, and, and later on with Francesco Pesce, uh, using some new sex data on alpha uh, that, 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 that we that we measured. And, um, and, and what I'm showing you here is just you know, one, of the, one of the outcomes uh, of this. Uh, so on the left-hand side, I'm showing you three different ensembles of alpha cyanuclein, one of them generated by flexible Meccano, and two of them generated by MDE simulations uh, by Paul Robustelli and Stefano Glana at DHO Research. Um, and they are sort of good uh, force fields that give rise to a good agreement you know, with, with, with many sorts of experiments. And you can see they all give relatively similar uh, distributions just of the radius of duration, but certainly not the same. This is shown over here on the left, right? So this is you know, just taking ensembles out of a simulation. And then we run them through this kind of basin or macromentropy procedure with some sex data and you know, this is then you know, one of the false fields give this blue, you know, this red line before we fit it. And then we fit the sex data effectively by reweighting. And when what we end up with are the ensembles on the right-hand side or the distribution of RG in this case. And you can see that you know, they're different from where they were because we fitted them to the sex data. But what you will also see is that they're much more similar to one another because we've effectively fitted them against this low resolution data. And what I'm not showing you, um, but you know, I'm happy to discuss later, or you, it's also discussed in these papers. If I instead of picking these three pretty good uh, priors, you know, the flexible Meccano or the two different empty simulations, if I picked a bad force field, I could have done the same. I would have had to push my distribution a lot more, and the results would be, you know, much more noisy, and eventually they become meaningless. And you know, the the, the transition between you know, a good fit and a meaningless fit is sort of gradual, um, but there are some internal controls in this procedure that allows us sort of to, to at least get some ideas about when we, 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 we meet these kind of pathologies. You know, this is effectively a free energy calculation uh, and you need some sort of overlap uh, when you do this. So this approach is, is, is pretty versatile and I think we've made it relatively easy to use. I'm just showing you here, you know, highlighting some different, you know, applications that we've done on, you know, many different types of systems, nucleic acids, peptides, IDPs, multi-domain proteins, uh, you know, lipid proteins, complexes, with sex and NMR in particular data. And I'm not going to talk about any of these in any detail, uh, just to say that, you know, we think that it's pretty versatile and I'll definitely recommend that you, you know, either look up these papers or try out the method on your own and the, and, and, and the software is, you know, there's, you know, examples, et cetera, online. Instead, I'll just do sort of a small side uh, story of something that you know, we published uh, just very recently um, that builds upon some other work where we're trying sort of to explore extensions of this approach. Uh, and the method here is called Absurda and it's called Absurda because it builds upon a method called Absurd uh, from, 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 from Nicholas Albi and Martin Blackledge. Uh, and, 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 and we use it in this case to examine uh, in a mild relaxation data uh, and, and, and the, the idea or the problem with NMR relaxation data is that it's not something that you can calculate just as an ensemble average over static structures. And so what we are trying to do is sort of to put dynamics or time back into the concept of protein dynamics. And so the approach that we're taking is effectively the same as what I just uh, talked about in the BME approach, only what we are reweighting is no longer individual confirmations, but instead small trajectories um, and so this is sort of illustrated up here in, in, in this uh, panel one here. So we have some long MD trajectory or multiple MD trajectories that we cut up into small blocks. And then there is some discussion about how you choose the blocks. And then from each of those blocks, you can calculate observables. In this case, we can uh, calculate correlation functions from each block that we can then Fourier transform to get power spectral densities that we can then combine to calculate, in this case, in amount of relaxation rates. Um, and then if we just take all the blocks and combine together, we get sort of the average and a mild relaxation rate. But then we can, in the same way as before, we can put in these weights here. And so we can weight the NMR relaxation rates instead of doing it over frames, we can now do it over the blocks. And then we can fit these weights that are now weights of the blocks or the sub trajectories to fit the NMR relaxation data. 
Um, and so this is sort of you know, similar to, to, to what I just described before. And as I said, this is sort of effectively an approach for Martin Blacklitz with a few uh, changes here and there, including this kind of regularization term uh, that I just discussed before. So we again, you know, regularize these weights uh, to avoid overfitting and added a few other uh, things uh, to, to, to the protocol. And this is work in particular by, by, by Felix Kummer and, uh, and Simone Oyoli in the, in the group. And so uh, uh, there's a lot of details in this paper and I'll just you know, show you two slides. One where we validated it, where we generated synthetic data. So we knew exactly the distributions that gave rise to the data. And there what we find, I'll just say this very briefly, is so that we can, we can fit the data very nicely. So we can start with some MD simulation. That these are these black points here that give rise to a reasonable disagreement between uh, the simulated uh, rates and the you know and the experimental rates where the experimental rates in this game comes from another MD simulation and we can fit the data and we can show that when we fit the relaxation data we improve a bunch of properties of the examples so we are particularly looking at sidechain and MR uh, relaxation data and we improve things like rotomer distributions and and other properties of, of of the dynamics and you know this is essentially what the method is is designed to do but what we also found was that actually when we applied it to real experimental data. Actually, the method worked uh, not quite as nicely as we'd hoped. And you know, we scratched our head for quite a while and we think we understand now why that's the case. Um, and so I'll just you know, finish this part you know, with this slide. And the, there are a couple of different problems uh, that are sort of biting us. And this is why we think that this is you know, uh, a, a, an interesting method, but it needs to be explored more. And effectively, we are probably hit by remaining force field problems. Uh, and secondly, we are hit by the problem that when we run an average over these short simulations, we are effectively at, you know, narrowing the distributions of the observables because we're already averaging over these small simulations. And that means that all the distributions of the observables sort of become more narrow. And so when we go fishing in the tails sort of to fit the data, there is much less tail to, to go fishing at because we've, na we've averaged them um, by, by, by this kind of averaging. So this is something we have some ideas on how to improve it. Uh, and, you know, as I, as I mentioned, we've here applied it to the Marvel relaxation data, but, you know, we're thinking about other kinds of dynamical data, you know, for instance, uh, dynamics data, for example, would be an obvious example. So if people have ideas, you know, do reach out to us and, and we're happy to discuss this. Instead, now what I'll talk about in the remaining time is methods that we can use sort of to improve the more fundamentally uh, simulations, in particular, how we can tweak uh, force fields or improve force fields using you know, disagreement between experiment and simulations. And so the starting point of this are sort of two independent studies uh, that we've done. On the left, I'm showing you some work that we did on the three domain protein tier one. This was done mostly by Andreas Larsen and together also with Lisa Alet's group, um, where we use coarse grain simulations of, of, of tier one and compared to small angle X ray and neutron scattering. And on the right, I'm showing you, uh, you know, uh, a collaboration with Tanya Mitzak group where Emil Thomasen, who's shown in the middle at the bottom, uh, did MD simulation and compared to small angle X-ray scattering data uh, on monomeric uh, H9P1, in this case, uh, data recorded by, by, by Eric Martin. And so, you know, these studies were done sort of independently. Um, and, you know, there's a bunch of things in these papers that I won't talk about, but one thing that came out of it was that when we ran coarse grain simulation using uh, a very commonly used tool, Martini, or a particular version of Martini, uh, we, 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 we realized that these simulations gave you know, pretty good examples, but they were you know, quite a bit too compact compared to what the nice small angle X-ray scattering and neutron scattering in the case of tier one uh, showed us. And so in these papers, we did a few sort of ad hoc changes to the Martini force field and used this kind of reweighting uh, techniques that I just uh, talked about. Um, and that worked fine. Now we could say interesting things about both of these proteins in, in, in these papers. Um, but, but, but realizing this problem, we sort of then asked the question, and this is what I'll just briefly touch upon, you know, can we, can we try to address this uh, point uh, more fundamentally? And so Emil in particular, together with uh, Francesco and Mede and, and Julio shown at the bottom, um, you know, took this one step further and collected a, a nice database of high quality sex data on, uh, on a bunch of intrinsically disordered proteins and ran you know, relatively long simulations in Martini. Uh, from all of them, I'm showing you here on the left, the agreement between the radius of duration calculated with the Martini simulation and the experimental RGs. And you can see why there's a good correlation in all cases, 
the rate of duration is quite a bit more compact than what the experiment uh, tells us. And so the question is, can we then improve this Martini model in a simple fashion to sort of at least temporarily get rid of this problem? And so based on, on work in, in, in the all atom force field, you know, when things are too compact, you know, we, we, we suggest that you know, maybe if we just increase the interaction strength by protein and water, and of course the protein will, will, will swell. And so we so they effectively rescale the interaction strength between protein beads and water beads in the Martini model by a factor lambda. And you can see, you know, show here on the left, this is what I showed you before. If you increase it by, by six to 8%, you can get you know, not only a good correlation, but also essentially quantitative agreement between the ranges of duration calculated from the simulations uh, and, 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 and experiment. And this we can either you know, compare directly to the RG, or of course, a more, 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 more direct comparison would be actually to take the simulation, calculate the small angle X-ray scattering data, and, 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 and do a comparison there. This is shown at the bottom here. And what you can find, see is that you know, this is sort of the average behavior. You can see we get an improvement as we increase the interaction strength to about six to eight percent, and then it sort of levels off. And what you can also see is that there is some spread for the different proteins of the optimal point uh, on, on this. And this I'll get into uh, to now. So, so while we see that this is sort of improving on, on, on on all scales, and again, my, my slide is frozen here, uh, you can see that there is variation for different proteins so that some proteins need to be tweaked less than other proteins. And what we in particular noticed was that if we take IDPs and compare them to multi-domain proteins with flexible linkers, we see sort of minima in, in different regions suggesting that this kind of simple rescaling is, you know, improves things, but it's not a universal solution that just makes everything perfect. So it makes everything better but you know, it's not like there's a single number that just fixes all problems. So at the moment, you know, we are saying, you know, improve it a little bit by maybe four to six to eight percent, and that will make everything better. Um, if you have some data on the system, we can do slightly better. And then we're exploring at the moment other ideas of making an even better transferable model. But one thing that we did try also, for example, is to simulate interactions between proteins. Now, for example, if we simulate, you know, alpha cyanuclein under conditions where it should be completely monomeric by an mass spectroscopy and we just use plain martini, we can see that it dimerizes, essentially it forms you know, a dimer 70% you know, of the time, which is wrong. So it's clearly too sticky. Um, and, but if you increase the interaction thing, you get something that is much more you know, in line with what you would get from, from for example, in my experiment. Um, whereas if you take uh, other proteins, you know, like FUS, which is known to, to, to optimize, you know, in the absence of rescaling, it's just a dimer 100% of the time but we can still see some dimer formation as you would expect for a protein that is known uh, to alkalize. And there's also some data on, on, on dimerization of, of, of folded ubiquitin, but I won't uh, really talk about that in any detail. So, so what we did was effectively that we took uh, the Martini model compared to a bunch of experimental data and saw there was you know, some, some problems. And then we did, you know, I'd say a semi-arbitrary, but not completely arbitrary, scaling of a single force field parameter and show that we can optimize the force field for, for this kind of problems. And again, I'm happy to discuss later about sort of pros and cons of this approach. But what we sort of also, of course, realized is that this is to some extent a little bit arbitrary picking out a single parameter from a force field. And so what we've also done, and this is just published you know, a couple of days ago, um, is that we asked the question, can we do something more systematically? So can we more systematically parameterize more or less an entire coarse grain force field using experimental data uh, alone. And so this is work in particular uh, done by, by Julio Tisse, shown here at the top left, but also with, with important contribution from Thierry Schulz and Ramon Crehuet. Uh, and again, this is just published now. And the, the basic idea is that we took sort of a CAFA based model with 20 independent parameters, and then we optimized these parameters on single chain uh, properties uh, of, 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 a, of a large set of IDPs with the goal of getting a model that was sufficiently fast uh, to sample interactions between IDPs and, and low complexity domains, both in dimeric states, but in particular with the goal of looking at, at biomolecular contency. So this is what I'll talk about for the remainder of the time. And so the starting point of this is, is work uh, from, well, there's work by, by, by many people, but you know, our our work was sort of starting uh, by, by, work, by work by by GT Metal and Rob Best and colleagues, uh, the HPS model. Uh, and sort of here I'm showing you on sort of a, a, a alpha based model. And, and essentially each you know, amino acid has a sort of a, you know, a stickiness parameter. 
uh, and they used a particular one called the HPS model. I'm showing you here the scale, you know, from, from something that is very sticky in their model, which is would be fit and alanine, to something that is sort of anti-sticky. In this case, this would be arginine is the least sticky or, you know, you know, you know not, not, not self-associating uh, residue in, in, in this system. So this is the model that we start with. Um, but actually we decided, you know, there's no reason to start with just a single stickiness parameter. And so before we do any optimization, we actually went out and looked at a whole large number of hydrobicity scales. And what we did is we did two things. We calculated so the average of this. This is a little bit arbitrary, but this is just to give us some, some representation of what this would be. This would be this kind of orange scale here. So this is the average hydrobicity scale averaged over you know, you know, more than 50 you know, hydrophobicity scales, but we also calculate a sort of a distribution of hydrophobicities. And this would then be our, our prior in a Bayesian optimization approach. And this is sort of illustrated, you know, and, and with this color, a color scale here. So you can see, for example, for arginine, there's sort of a bias for them to be sort of relatively little sticky. And if you look over here on the right-hand side, for example, isoleucine, you can see that this is mostly, you know, quite sticky, but you can see also things like proline is sort of actually not so hydrophobic. And there's some broad distribution. So this will be our statistical prior in a Bayesian framework. Um, and then I'm also showing here one also recently optimized scale, this, this HPS Jury scale, um, that you know we also use as a comparison in, in some of our this is work you know, uh, done by, by GT and Metal's group. And so again, before we do any optimization, I'll just show you a sort of a baseline comparison using you know, either this HPS model or this average scale across these. So if we take a bunch of sort of normal IDPs that are sort of hydrophilic and relatively expanded. And we run them in these two, you can see that this average scale actually does a pretty good job of predicting the RG. So there's small deviations between the calculated and the experimental numbers. So that works pretty well. Whereas the HPX model essentially predicts them to be very compact. So, you know, too compact compared to experiment. On the other hand, if we take a bunch of variants of the low complexity domain from A1 uh, measured in tandem intax group, we find that actually this HPS model does a pretty good job of predicting those, whereas this average model essentially predicts them to be too expanded. So these models sort of work, you know, pretty well on two opposite ends of the of the stickiness scale. And so what we did is we turned to some work that we'd actually done, you know, many many years ago. You know, in 2008, this is work uh, done by Anders Norgal, who was a, a, a master student back in the days, coming up with an iterative scheme of optimizing force field parameters. Uh, by targeting experimental data. And, you know, we, we made some changes uh, along the way. This is again described in this paper. So we're optimizing some likelihood function here, essentially trying to you know, improve agreement with, with NMR uh, PIE data and RG values from SACS and using this hydrophobicity scale as a statistical prior in the optimization. So we run simulations, we calculate observables, then we do changes in force field space and since we don't want to resample too often, we have sort of a reweighting approach where we essentially can estimate changes in the PIEs and the RGs without resampling. And then once we've done that a little bit, we can then, you know, we can then optimize that. And then once in a while we have to resample uh, and then go back and, and, and optimize again. So the first step in all of this is, you know, to collect lots of data. So we went out in the literature and, you know, thank you to all you experimentalists who deposit data and measure nice data. And you know, if you have more data, we'll 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 we'll, we'll use it. And at some point, we should start using, uh, you know, in, uh, data from 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 FRED also. But this is essentially all radio abstraction from from sex experiments, as well as PIE data from NMR. Um, and and so we collected all this data and put it in the database. Uh, and then what I'll show you now is sort of you know an example of what this optimization procedure is doing. <clears throat> so and I'll show the movie playing in a few seconds. What you'll see are, are four panels up here. Is this kind of stickiness scale that will be updated as we are optimizing. Uh, I'll show you just the example. In this case, this is alpha synuclein, but we are targeting all these you know, 45 different proteins at the same time. And I'll just show you the agreement again, just with one data set from the PIEs over here on the right and the rate of duration, the distribution and the average from the simulation. So this is the HPS model. You can see that it predicts you know, alpha synuclein to be very, very compact, much more compact than it should be. And you know, again, you know, also seen here in the PIs. And then once we start this, you can see all these parameters that are moving up and down. And we can sort of you know, effectively improve agreement with the, with the PIs. And eventually we can sort of converge to getting a good agreement on the RG uh, of alpha synuclein and all these other proteins and the PIs for all these. And then we end up with this sort of final 
set of parameters that are you know, similar for some amino acids and quite different for, for other amino acids. And so again, once my slide updates on this end here, you will see here the result of the optimization. So we have three different models. This is described in more detail, the paper called M1, M2, and M3. And you can see that we get you know, good agreement with the RG data. This is the data we've been fitting. Um, and you know, this of course is in part driven by the fact that you know, there are different lengths, but even if you compare to different variants of the A1 LCD, again, this is the data from Telemetax group that all the same length, but differ in amino acid uh, sequence, we can see we actually get a, a pretty good you know, correlation between the experimental and the calculated radius of, of, of gyration of these. And you can see here the parameters from these three different models that you can sort of compare to the, to the other models. And there are a number of different uh, differences. And in particular, what you will notice is that arginine is in fact a very sticky amino acid, much more sticky than in this original HPS uh, model. And this is something that, you know, that we didn't discover than other people have, have, have seen over the years, uh, but that's something that comes out very nicely automatically um, from this optimization procedure. Just to show you that this method is, is relatively robust, I'm showing here at the top, the result of two independent optimizations targeting the same likelihood function, but starting from two different force fields. You know, one of them is what I just showed you, and the other one is just to set all the parameters to the same model. And effectively, you can see, you know, combining the data with the prior, we get a more or less unique solution of the force field. It's not exactly the same, so we're still limited a little bit by the data, um, but we get a pretty robust optimization of the force field by this kind of automated procedure. And of course, the more data we get in, the more we can, we can keep optimizing uh, this. So for the last few minutes, I'll just talk about what we can use this for. Um, the first thing we did was to look at, at dimerizations of IDPs. Um, we can benchmark that against NMR data. On the left, I'm showing you intermolecular PIEs, where you mix essentially spin label in 14 protein and unspin label in 15 protein and look at PIE effects between proteins. And you know, it's actually quite complicated, but we get, I'd say, relatively good agreement uh, between the simulations and the, and the experiments. And on the right-hand side, I'm just showing you the fraction of, of dimer when we run these things, uh, running it under conditions where we know that these three proteins here should essentially not dimerize, whereas these two proteins over here should dimerize. And we do see you know, some substantial fraction of dimer of these two proteins that are hydrophobic self-associating proteins, and we see no uh, self-association of alpha synuclein and these two other IDPs. And it turns out that actually this is a, a pretty difficult test to pass because many of these more hydrophobic uh, mods would actually form substantial amount of dimers of things that should not dimerize under these conditions. And we have data to show that they shouldn't be dimerizing. So having done that, we can then of course use more than two chains so we can effectively again copy work from others and study multi-chain simulations and try to calculate phase properties and you reduce these kind of snap geometries. Again, other people have, have pioneered this work. So we can run this into these elongated boxes and we can sort of see self-associated into some condensate and some, some single chains that are floating about out here. And we can calculate effectively the concentration in the condensate and the concentration in the dilute phase. And from these simulations, they have to be relatively long to converge, but you know, we can, can do this. And again, um, there's a bunch more data in the paper, but you can see that we can actually predict you know, with, with a pretty good correlation, you know, the saturation for concentration, not only for, 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 for individual IDPs, but actually for many different IDPs with quite varied sequences. So this turns out to be actually quite difficult to calculate saturation concentrations of sequences that are very different. And so it's not perfect. And again, this is something we are exploring more. But again, just to remind you that we only optimize these force fields on the single chain properties, and then we are applying them to the condensates um, and we get a pretty good agreement uh, between the, the phase properties. Now that there are some issues with the temperature that we need to use, and this is discussed in more detail in the papers. So I don't want to, to oversell it, but I think we're doing a, a pretty good job of, of calculating these things. Of course, one of the reasons why we are doing this is because we want to look at the actual interactions uh, between these. And you know, I'll, I'll finish just by showing that you can sort of, you can, for example, look at the similarity of intra and intermolecular interactions this is sort of the whole premise of the work that we can optimize on single chain properties because the interactions in the single chain are the same interactions between chains. Again, this is work that has been known in the polymer field for, for, for many years and pioneered in the, 
compensate uh, field by by Rohi Papo and 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 and, and colleagues. Um, and we see this come out very nicely. I'm showing here, you know, contact maps, you know, either within the single chain or within the left, and the part of course from the diagonal that is different in the single chain. You can see these kind of strong interactions. So low color here means you know strong interactions. You can see a very similar pattern if we look at two in this case uh, proteins together, or if you look at you know the interactions between the central chain and the condensate and all the other chains in the condensate. So this is true for for for, for both. A2 and, and FUS that we looked at in the paper. And if you sort of sum up these interaction maps across, you know, across, uh, you know, all the interaction partners, this is shown at the bottom, you can sort of see it's the same amino acids that are sort of sticky, you know, either in the individual chains or in the dimers or in the context with some subtle differences that we think are interesting to explore. For example, you know, if you look here at A1, you can see, you know, for example, at the end terminus, you can see that, you know, that in the condensate, these things are more sticky in the condensate than they are in the single chain. So, you know, if you're looking at the single chain, there are some edge effects that 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 that, that give rise to to some differences. And this is something that we'd like to to explore more. We can also look at things like you know the expansion of the chain, and we see sort of in line with what you would expect from theory that you know that the, at least for these kind of hydrophobic uh, things, they are you know they are slightly more complex. So these have scaling exponents that are you know smaller than 0.5. So, you know, so they are sort of below uh, the, 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 the theta point. And so they actually expand when they go into the condensate because they're now, you know, in, in this kind of melt of other chains that are sort of expanding them compared to the solvent, which is a poor solvent. So they're effectively moving from a poor solvent to a better solvent in, in the condensate. And you can see they're all sort of moving uh, towards point five. And what we also see is that if we look particularly here at the A1, we can see that there is more variation between the variants in the single chain compared to the condensates where they appear to be, at least in this model, to be more similar in the condensates. So with that, I'd like to, 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 to summarize just very, very briefly um, that, you know, that if you have simulations and you have experiments and you want sort of to, uh, to combine them, you can either take sort of the more simple approach or just reweigh the bias, you know, individual simulations with individual experiments. And I gave you a few examples of this, or, you know, you can go sort of more broad and try to optimize the force fields. And again, we're not the first people to do this, but, you know, I've showed you, you know, sort of a more specific example with this Martini model or more general example with this cost range model, where we think we've developed a model that works pretty well for, for, for a range of different low complexity domains and IDPs you know, for interactions between them. And we're hoping that people will start to, to benchmark and maybe break the model so we can figure out how to improve them more. So before acknowledging, you know, the final people, I'll just tell you all to, uh, to come to Greece. Uh, next week, there is uh, one week of deadline left before applying for this summer school in integrative structural biology. If you don't remember, if you just go to Google and you type my name in Greece in 2022, you'll find a link to this workshop that is going to be fantastic. And uh, so do send your students or postdoc to Greece. Uh, that would be great. We're looking forward to that. And finally, I'd just like to, to acknowledge the people. In particular, I think I mentioned all the people along the way. Um, but the Martini work was done in particular by Emil Thomas, who's standing here. And the final work was done, you know, in particular by, by Julio Tissé. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Kristen, for a terrific talk. Um, we already have a number of, of, of uh, questions here. Um, let me start. Let me see who's the first. Um, yeah, first question is by Gabor Nagy. Gabor, please. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Absolutely. Yes, I'll just stop sharing and then I can also maybe. Perfect. Um, thank you for the very nice talk, Kristen. I, I really enjoyed it. I had uh, actually not one, but two questions in the end, but you partially answered both of them during your talk. So the first uh, question would have been, um, you mentioned that uh, you could technically reweight conformational states, uh, what you sampled through an MD simulation. And there was a note that this does not necessarily reproduce the true uh, free energy landscape, but typically gets better than, than it was before. Um, and I, I agree to this uh, completely, but necessarily your prior does not have to come from one force field per se, right? Um, no, no, I mean, you can, you can define your prior in whatever way, right? I mean, we, Think of the prior as our best bet, knowing everything we know apart from the data that we'll fit 
and you can have your own best bet, right? Your own best bet can be, you know, the FF99 disc force field, or it can be flexible Meccano, and that's your personal choice, right? This is, you know, this is the Bayesian approach. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, the better that, you know, the better your guess is, the more likely it is that you will, you know, get closer to, 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 to the truth. Mm -hmm. May I ask you, uh, do you think if you would sample like practically the whole phase space with a very large number of, of short simulations, would you be able to recover the, the true free energy landscape from a sufficient amount of experimental data? Would that be sufficient? Well, exactly. I think you know, that depends on your, if, if your definition of sufficient is that you capture the full free energy landscape, then that's true per definition. Um, right? So, you know, so suffi if sufficient means that you probe all aspects of the ensemble, then of course you could. One thing that's nice about this approach uh, and other approaches, but not all approaches, which is important to note is that if your force field is already perfect, or at least if your force field already agrees with the data, you don't do any change to your example. Mm. And so, so that's that's a clear advantage of this. So at least it's self-consistent in that sense. But I think there's a whole number of philosophical points about this, you know, and you know, practical points of how much you need to sample. And I think you very quickly run into all of these that, you know, in practice, I think we're limited by by by, by many other things, including how we compare with the data uh, and you know how good our force fields are and and and, and not let's say the theoretical point of whether you would actually recover exactly the same ensemble. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, the next question is by, um, by Ben, Ben, please. Thank you very much, Kirsten, for this wonderful integration of experiment and simulations. It's, it's really, it's fantastic to, to watch the, the, the progress in this field and it's been essential for interpreting experiments in so many ways. I had a, a specific question about one point that you only showed in passing, uh, which was you had one of your slides, you had ubiquitin, and uh, that was in context of, of the water scaling that you did for the Martini force field. And it seemed like um, the, the, the folded state of ubiquitin was quite sensitive to this water scaling parameter. So it's not surprising that you destabilize folded structures, but it seemed pretty extreme in this case. And so I was wondering, what, what's your take on, on the right balance to choose there? Is it really something where we will never have a, a convergence of um, simulations on folded proteins and IDPs or what else could be done? So, so, so I'll just say what the slide showed because I didn't talk about it in any detail. It's described in the paper. Uh, and Emil Tomeisen, I can see is here. He's the one that did the work. So he can also just jump in if I say something wrong. So what we're not doing here, we're not looking at the unfolding of ubiquitin. So in Martini force fields, you staple the folded bits together. So we are just here looking at the interactions between two ubiquitin chains that are folded. Mm -hmm. um, and we're comparing to NMR data that probes the very weak uh, transient interactions between folded ubiquitin. So if you take ubiquitin to you know, five millimolar-ish, it will dimerize and you can see where it dimerizes. And, you know, it gets the problem in, in you know, there's a bunch of problems with this. One of them is that Martini isn't a perfect force field. And so it doesn't actually predict the dimerization interface correctly. And then that leaves the question of how do we compare to experiments, right? So we can do this in a bunch of different ways. We can either say, we just count contacts or we count only the right contacts that are brought by experiment. And we get slightly different answers for these. But what I can say is that, you know, it looks like both the ubiquitin dimerization that I just talked about, or if we look at the multi-domain proteins with flexible linkers, they tend to behave differently than the pure IDPs. So this suggests that this kind of tweaking that we're doing should be different for folded proteins than for disordered proteins. And whether this is due to differences, the amino acid composition, or whether it's due to differences in the you know, the shape and the number of water molecules around each amino acid or other things we don't really know yet. We've tried a few things and we have more ideas, but we don't really know yet. So I, I think that there's hope to get this to work uniformly, but, you know, we don't have that solution yet, but, but, but certainly 
you know, we have we have things left to explore. Thanks very much. So I got this slightly wrong. But maybe can I ask another question? And that regards the scaling exponents that you found in the condensates. It's also something that we discussed when I was in, in Copenhagen. Uh -huh. And so um, I think all the cases you showed were chains that were more compact um, in isolation. And then in the dense phase, um, the scaling exponent increased. Now, um, according to Flory and the excluded volume screening and the like, you would expect the same also to happen in the other direction. So if you had a chain uh, with a scaling exponent greater than 0.5 in uh, free solution, then you would expect it to also converge to a scaling exponent of 0.5 in the condensate. And I was wondering whether you, you've ever seen uh, a case of that sort as well. We, we haven't looked at those sequences uh, in part because our model is particularly useful for things that are sort of compact and sticky, although we could probably find something that is slightly above 0.5 and crank up the concentration or something and see what happens. But we haven't done that, but it's, uh, you know, it would be a good test, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not of Flory, but of, uh, but of our, you know, model. <laughs> Think of both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Okay, so the next question is by King Shu Gosh. King Shu, please. Hi, uh, wonderful talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, I have a question and uh, maybe I misunderstood this. So what I'm seeing is um, you are probably creating a posterior distribution with the data and the prior, and then you are maximizing it to predict. What if we don't maximize the posterior, if we create the whole distribution in theta? Right, so in, you have the theta as the parameter, right? In other, I don't know how sharp the distribution is that depends on data and we don't have a lot of data. So if we keep the whole distribution in theta and then predict, do we improve or do we lose things? But what happens? It's a very good point and it's something that we haven't explored in either limit, but I think in particular in the last part of the force field optimization, I think this is something that we you know, as a group and we as a field should explore. And so what we would effectively get out at the end, if we sample, you know, even at a thick theta, if we sample the posterior, we would get out a distribution of force fields. Right? And then what we would do is we would run simulations with a bunch of different force fields and we would integrate out effectively the force field there. Right? This should, I mean, you know, it's sort of trivial to do, but right? it's, you know, it's a little bit, you know, complicated to, to sort of, you know, interpret it. But I think it's the, it's the right approach eventually. And I think in this case, we are, you know, the fact that we actually have a well-defined prior, you know, I think make, makes it, makes it uh, worthwhile to do. And one thing that would make it particularly nice would be that if then, you know, at some point someone comes with, you know, five extra experimental measurements, we will then use that posterior as our prior for the next optimization round Right, so we don't have to re-optimize everything, right? We would just, you know, we would use the prior, we would redo the procedure, but just optimizing those. And it's, you know, it's all doable. It's, you know, it's technically a little bit complicated to sample that posterior um, because it's still a hard, you know, it's still a hard sampling problem, but I think there's nothing fundamental that prevents us from doing this. Um, um, and I think it's, you know, I, you, you're absolutely right at the, at the conceptual level, definitely, I agree completely, but we haven't explored it in any detail. Thank you. So, Kristen, when looking in, in the chat, uh, I already foresee it's going to be a long discussion section. I yeah. hope you have a coffee at hand. Um, I, 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 have, I don't have coffee, but I had a lot of coffee earlier, and uh, it's fine. I have time. Very good. Fantastic. So, the next question is by Zoe Cornea. Zoe. Hi, really nice talk, and i uh, really looking forward to welcome you to Greece. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, that uh, the following. Uh, so we know that Martini has the alnadine constraints. So uh, in your approach, do you completely remove these constraints and expect that the protein will assume the secondary structure? Good, 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 good point. Yes. So in the simulations of the pure IVPs, we have no constraints. Um, are the protein, the multi-domain proteins, we have constraints within each folded domain but not between the domains. There is nice NMR and other data to show that the domains are folded and these kind of things. For the secondary transient secondary structure, um, this is, you know, uh, you know, in principle, I think a completely valid point uh, that, you know, there could be transient secondary structure in these IDPs that could affect compaction. Uh, 
none of these proteins have particularly strong secondary structures, so I would not expect it to change the radius of gyration much. You know, 10%, 20% transient helical structure in, or maybe even 40% in a residue, or you know, maybe 10 residues out of 100 would not affect the overall radius of gyration that much. Um, so I don't think it changes uh, the RG, but of course it's correct that we are not, you know, well, I'm just saying, no, we're not capturing the transient sector structure. And I really don't think that there is much hope, at least at the moment, to get transient formation of secondary structure in IDPs with a Martini model, unless someone does something smart for the backbone potential. Yeah, I was thinking about and, you know, that. That's, oh. not, you know, that's not what we're doing. So we are really looking at, you know, you know, transit interactions between side chains or whatever we call them in Martini. So in the case of alpha synuclein or CIMIC that fold uh, upon interaction with some partners, it's not possible to, to use this, right? That, okay. is that is not, no, that is correct. But also I'll just stress this so that it's a bit, you know, clear. Right? We have taken the IDPs out of the context of all other molecules apart from water, mm, okay. including in Martini. So there is a good chance that we have broken other things in Martini. Right, so we could have broken, you know, protein lipid interactions, right? Um, and so yeah. I, you know, so we, we've in one case we've looked at a, a membrane proteins where we did this, um, and you know it works well, but you know the, the real thing to do, of course, would be to be a more global optimization of Martini, but taking these kind of things into account. But that's you know that's a much bigger effort, as you know. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, the next question is by Gilad. Kristen, thank you very much for the nice talk. So I have a fairly general and perhaps a bit philosophical question. So I guess the forefathers of uh, force fields, they were thinking about generating something that is quite universal and maybe transferable from one problem to another. Are we getting close to that or are we actually moving away from that? That depends on your definition of we, I think. Uh, but, well, but you, I, I, actually I, you, not me. I'm not I, doing I, any of that. I, I, I would say we are getting closer. You know, both, both we as a group and we as a field are getting closer, right? I think that, you know, we are, we are trying, you know, we are trying as a field to break force fields in many different ways. And then there are a couple of different approaches, right? One approach is to do a very, very local optimization on that single system. This is effectively what the re-weighting does. That's of course not transferable. Uh, or you can then optimize it on a single class of molecules. Uh, and that you know, is transferable across sequences, but within a class of problems. And, but of course, at the same time, you know, when people do the harder work of optimizing and benchmarking broader sets of proteins, right, then, then you, know, you need to take a balance. But of course, you know, in the end, it depends a little bit on what your goal is. You know, I think I don't think it's, but you know, I think it's fruitful sometimes to think of this as a Bayesian approach, right? And you know, if you you are allowed to pick your prior as you want, right? And if you know, and 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 then of course, if you pick a force field that is known to work extremely well for some restricted set of problems, you might fool yourself if you think that you know how the system works. But then that's you know that's up to you. That's sort of now now we make this an explicit bias. But I do think that you know clearly it's, it's you know force fields have improved. You know, across different types of proteins, across proteins and nucleic acids, both core screen and all that. Some, but you know, those kind of bigger things are, you know, difficult things. Um, I think the last thing that I talked, and that's you know, not you know, we we're doing this, and many other people have taken this approach. I think is really what the field needs. It's a systematic way of linking many different pieces of information into optimization in a very self-consistent way. It's you know, it's it's expensive and heavy. And, but at least it's self-consistent. You can sort of spread out the error in whatever way that you like. And of course you can include, you know, QM data and whatnot. So I would say, yes, the field overall is clearly moving towards things that are more transferable. And then at the same time, taking shoots off to the side if you want more specialized things. Okay, thank you for the very optimistic answer. <laughs> I have to be optimistic. I'm too young to not be optimistic. That's, that's in the job description to be optimistic. <laughs> All right. Uh, so next question is by Rafael Petrosian. Uh, hello. Yeah, thank, thanks for an interesting talk. 
so in case the condensate is composed of uh, different IDPs with uh, different uh, uh, composition of amino acids, how well could, could your model predict the phase uh, behavior for such, such systems? Um, the, 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 the short answer is we don't know yet. And you know, we, we've looked at mixed condensates uh, and we can see things partition or whatever you call it, you know, in condensates, um, but we've not yet compared it uh, in detail to, uh, to actual experimental measurements of, you know, these, you know, more complicated phase diagrams. And of course, you know, you need to vary the concentrations and, and, and there are not that many experimental measurements of these kind of more complicated phase diagrams for different proteins. There are nice measurements of proteins and nucleic acids, but of course we don't have a C alpha model for the nucleic acids. Uh, uh, you know, there are other people that have developed similar kind of one bead model for, 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 for nucleic acids. Um, so it's doable. We are very interested in this. We can see things partitioned, but we haven't done quantitative comparisons yet, but that's certainly high on the list of things to do. Okay. And is, is, is there a way to incorporate that in, in, intermolecular interactions? Uh, in the optimization, you mean? Yeah, um, in your model. In principle, yes. I mean, we, we've so far tried to avoid it because calculating phase properties is difficult and slow. And so it's difficult mm -hmm. to use in this kind of iterative optimization. And um, so that's why we benchmark, you know, we optimize on single chain properties. Um, and we hope that we can get away with that for a while. But if not, you know, we have to come up with some other way of doing it or effectively reweighting against, you know, uh, condensate things. You can do that. You know, it, that's definitely doable for a smaller search space. And so maybe one option is to sort of do a smaller search space and look at more complicated properties. This is what other people have done very successfully. But we've, we've so far just stay stuck with single chain properties. Um, but you know, we still see, you know, we we still get the interactions, right? Um, it's just yeah. not clear exactly how well it works. Um, but but you know, by by the analogy of you know intra versus intra interactions, you know, in principle it should work. But of course, we'll see when we start to compare two experiments. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, just in case you cannot read it, first, then Dave Terumala says, "Very nice talk." Um, oh, just wrote it in the chat. So uh, next question by uh, Stefano. Uh, nice talk, Kirsten. Um, you showed that you can uh, basically refine uh, MD ensembles to MD ensembles as well as try to res uh, refine MD ensembles to experimental ensembles. I was wondering, uh, can you refine experimental ensembles to experimental ensembles from two different sets of experiments? And then thinking on the context of improving uh, let's say the uh, improving the, the parameters that help you to uh, go from experiment to, to structural ensembles. Right? But sometimes there is some uncertainty in what an experiment actually means in terms of an ensemble. Right? That's, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, so, uh, th that's a good point. I, uh, you know, I, I haven't thought about this. So what, what I can say, which is answering a slightly different question, is that what we can do is, so in all of these, I didn't talk about this, but you know, this is something that of course is important, is how we calculate the experimental observables is really key. And I sort of skipped all of this, but this is something we've worked quite a bit on for sex data and other things. Uh, and there is some uncertainty uh, in that. And there, uh, there, you know, we need, you know, essentially we're left with sort of, with sort of an underdetermined problem. So we have uncertainty both in the ensemble and in the way that we calculate the data. And so we've sort of come up with some self-consistency tests that work for this. And of course, to do that, we need some systems where we sort of know the correct answer and their experimental examples are, are, are really useful. So if we have experimental examples and we have, you know, other data, we can use that to understand the relationship between the data and the ensembles. So for example, what is the contribution of you know, uh, solvent to sex experiments or what is, you know, what is, you know, what does rotomer distributions in EPR or FRET determine, right? You know, if you don't know the ensemble, then it's difficult to come up 
with, with these kind of, of links. But apart from that, it's it's not something we've we've looked at. We've looked a little bit at you know how different subsets of experimental data affect the ensembles, um, and sort of trying to figure out you know what is the minimal set of data that you need to construct ensembles. But I don't think that's exactly what you were, were asking either. Thanks. Yes, it's, it's sort of along this line. Yeah, exactly. I'll think more about it. Okay, so next question is by uh, Vitor Leiter. Vitor. Hi, Crespin. Well, thank you so much for the inspiring talk. Um, with your approach, you have nicely discussed uh, the overall parameter, like uh, radio soft vibration. Um, what about the details? And uh, could you comment on how well you would describe the details, such as secondary structure formation, the, as you can imagine, as we have seen in an HE1? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, good. So I think the core screen mods that we've used they don't capture secondary structure, but then of course there are other details that do matter. You know, for example, which residues drive the compaction, and what are other, uh, you know, long-range interactions between different parts of the protein. Um, and I think we're capturing that at least to some extent. So, for example, the the paramagnetic relaxation enhancement NMR data is probing also compaction, but you know, in more detail than a sex experiment. And so when we optimize against that, we are getting information about, you know, more, more specific long range interactions uh, between, you know, different parts of the protein or between different proteins if we're looking at, at a protein protein interactions. So I think we are capturing some of those experiments, but, but you're absolutely right. Um, you know, as soon as we move to cross grain models, we are sacrificing some things. And I think in these models, what we're sacrificing definitely is transient secondary structure, which of course, in some cases does not matter at all. And in other cases is the only thing that matters maybe, right? And so, you know, I think this is, you know, and this is maybe coming back to uh, Gilad's question is also, you know, you know, when we talk about transferability, we are, we are restricting ourselves to a subset of problems when we're using coarse grain models. And then there are some problems that simply can't be addressed by these simply because, you know, there are things that matter that we don't, we don't capture, but, you know, no, I think that's always the case in both experiments and simulations, right? There's no single experimental technique that works for everything, maybe apart from minimal spectroscopy. Uh, but 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 <laughs> but apart from that, you know, so we have to we have to 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 give up on some things. And in this case, you know, what we're giving up on is 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 probably secondary structure. And then for some of these models, there are also certain types of interactions that we maybe don't capture as well. You know, we are not really sure how well we capture electrostatic interactions. I think we have some evidence that suggests we're capturing it okay. Um, but of course, you know, it could be that, for example, in this uh, core screen model where we have no water, but we have sort of a distance dependent dielectric, there are clearly electrostatic things that we don't capture. Although I think we're capturing it a lot better than we thought. In the Martini model, if you'd asked me two years ago or maybe more about whether we could capture effect of of salt, I would say, you know, not, but again, you know, you know, you know, work on, on H and I P one show that we can capture, you know, salt effects, for example, on on, on compaction and long range interactions. Um, so it, it really depends on the question uh, what these different models can do. Right? But none of them can do secondary structure, I'm afraid. Are there if you would trust more or less trust uh, some details of the model, which ones you would say, well, this can give uh, reasonable uh, uh, value for those. Uh, as we discussed, secondary structure is, is a bad thing, but what about contacts and other stuff? I mean, do you think they can be trusted? I, 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 I think they can be trusted, you know, not perfectly, but you know, it's a, it's a good enough, it's a good enough guess that it's useful to, you know, to test hypotheses or predict no observables, but I guess the first thing is the most important. And, you know, we, we can say, you know, these things interact with these things over here, so we think we understand the mechanism of, you know, binding or interaction or condensate formation. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. So you're almost through, Kristen. Next question is by Anna Papagiorgio. Anna, are you still with us? <laughs> 
Yes, hi. Uh, so thank you very much for your talk. Uh, so you highlighted that with them, these simulations, like you can get inside of how intramolecular or intermolecular interactions uh, contribute to the condensates. And um, if I'm not mistaken, usually condensates contain also various oligomeric states of like domains with IDRs or between IDRs, right? Uh, so my question, like my next question is like, can we use MD to extract information about like the various oligomeric species that are present uh, and also about uh, like this, the spatial distribution in the condensates. Yeah, that's uh, you know we, we've we've not really explored this. I would say so. We've really only looked at you know at condensates that are formed by a single IDP or LCD without any folded parts. Um, and the way that we've looked at them, they you know we've looked at them in ways that where they're pretty homogeneous. I mean, of course, they are not completely homogeneous and the surface is different from the core. We've looked at that a little bit, but not, by, not much. Um, and we've not looked at, for example, folded domains and, 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 and definitely in things that are not, not proteins, although this, of course, is something that is, 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 is very important. Um, I'd say with the things we've looked at, everything looks to be pretty, you know, pretty homogeneous. Uh, you know, across the condensate, but it could be that we've not looked at them in sort of the, the right way uh, to, 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 to look at this. So for example, do you form, form subclusters or, you know, do you see long time scale dynamics and maturation and these kind of things? Those are all things that, you know, could be going on um, that we just haven't looked at. So, so for example, between even IPRs, uh, once you say homogeneous, you mean like there is like one-to-one -one stichiometry or if there is like multivalency or uh, this kind of stuff, you can't like, uh, like you can't extract information about this kind of thing. Yeah, right? yeah. So, we, so when I say homogeneous, I mean sort of, you know, maybe I should say heterogeneous. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, the, everything is spread out very much, but, you know, but, but looking at, you know, one chain is the same as looking at another chain and, you know, it's not like we see small clusters within the condensates that we can at least clearly pick up as being different. So we sort of see it more as a polymer melt uh, where all the chains are sort of more or less uh, equivalent, at least, you know, at least for the stuff that we've looked at, you know. So for example, you know, in these contact maps, you know, we sort of looked at the, the contact between the central chain where central means the one that's closest to the center of mass versus other ones. And, you know, the although that map should not be symmetric, it is sort of more or less symmetric. Um, but of course, many of these contexts are not formed at the same time, but there's some average over many different conformations and, and interaction partners, and both, you know, between two molecules and that. So they're definitely, you know, not stoichiometric in, in, in any way. They're all very transient and, and distributed interactions. And so they're definitely very multivalent and transient. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And this is also, you know, this is what we sort of put in no, so it's not, you know, it's not a, you know, that's not a prediction. This is what the model you know, is set up to do. And we're parameterizing it on data that shows this. So this is sort of, you know, it's not a discovery, but just a nice conclusion that the model is doing, you know, what we expect it to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, next question by Victor Say. See. Hey, thank you for sticking around uh, for, for all the questions. I had one about the, what I'll call the revised um, stickiness model of the amino acids in the last part of your talk. Yeah. Um, and and I, if I understand correctly, arginine turned out to be more sticky than expected. Um, it looked like glycine was very sticky and alanine uh, was not very sticky at all. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you could say anything um, about this on, on a molecular level, why, why the results seemed to turn out the way they did. Uh, I, I, I wish I could. Uh... Uh, we, you know, we don't really know. And, you know, of course, I, you know, you know my, 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 my politician answer would be that, you know, this is exactly why we are doing this. Uh, you know, we, we couldn't predict upfront what it should be. So we let the data tell us what they should be because we don't have a good enough physical understanding of these things. Right? And I just want to, to re reiterate, right, that the, the finding of arginine being sticky is not novel, right? This has been seen experimentally and also computationally by, by, by many other groups. I think the only thing on the arginine side that is not novel, but at least you know, nice that comes out of our work uh, 
is that we don't need to treat arginine interactions with other amino acids in a specific way. Right? So what I didn't say, but you know, we use combining rules. Um, so arginine is sticky with everything else. It's not that it's sticky with only aromatic rings and negatively charged amino acids. We find it to be generally sticky. So we don't see, we don't have any evidence to introduce specific pairwise interactions, for example, between arginine and tyrosine. We can just let arginine be sticky and then that's, that fits it well. So we can, you know, in the optimization language, we can, you know, we can use just, you know, 20 parameters rather than fill out the whole pairwise uh, matrix. In terms of the physical understanding, you know, I think the approach and other people have done this is to, you know, look, you know, at, at all as an MD uh, with a good force field, maybe even, you know, polarizable model. Uh, Papu has a nice paper on this, on, on arginine versus lysine, for example. Um, that you know, shows at the molecular level why, you know, why arginine, for example, you know, is different from, from lysine. Specifically for glycine versus alanine, you know, the obvious guess is that there is some backbone interactions in the experiments uh, together with the flexibility of glycine that makes it you know, more, more likely to interact with other things than alanine, which is more restricted in the motions and maybe cannot form as many hydrogen bonds. Um, but you know, our model, of course, of you know being coarse grain, we cannot really see this in, in any way. So we just see that they don't stick to other things. So you know, my, my non-politician answer is that you know, I think you know, I would love to know this, and we just have no no clue. And it's very difficult to go back uh, to, to, to the to the atomistic models and, and and answer these questions. I think you know we would have to really you know use all that good all as MD force fields through this, and then of course. We would have to rely on all some empty force fields to capture these kind of interactions uh, accurately enough, and I'm not sure whether we are there yet. And it's also certainly difficult to uh, to converge. There are selected examples of people looking at condensates of small peptides, um, but you know, converging even a single IDP is very difficult. So converging a, a condensate for a long period of time is something that people are doing. There's a few papers out there, but not you know, not that we have these answers to these questions. So. I, I, I wish I could give you a clear answer, but unfortunately, I, 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 I can't. Okay, so so maybe maybe finally, uh, Chris, and just to follow up this question, because this was also something that was uh, was sticking in my mind after after Gilad's question. Um, I mean, the deviation between between the pattern of, of um, stickiness that you found for synuclein and the HPS model, I mean, is really significant. It's it's really hugely different. And on the on the other hand, I mean, of course, um, coarse grained models are sort of the optimal combination between or interpolation between analytical theories on one hand side and, and all atom simulations. So they're definitely extremely important in the future. So question is. Um, have you already done um, uh, um, uh, coarse grain simulations using experimental results on, on, on different other proteins? Is this what you're planning in order to figure out whether there are patterns that are consistently found throughout and that would make the coarse grain model more transferable? Because in the end, HPS, all the hydrophobicity scales, they, they were measured typically with tripeptides and, 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 and based on, on transfer free energies, which is not the same as having an amino acid in, in, a, in, a, in a whole polypeptide. So question Question is what is the future there, and so what's the direction you want to go? Uh, good, good point. So you know, in in in, in the paper that's just out now, we actually compare our optimized model to all the hydrophobicity scales out there, and you know, there are so many hydrophobicity scales, so you could always find something that agrees with it, and then you know, the one that agrees well. I mean, the the distinguishing feature of this scale, which I then don't think we should call a hydrophobicity scale, like we should call it a stickiness scale. Uh, or something else because it's not hydrophobicity in, in any normal sense. You know, you know the, the outstanding effect of it is this you know stickiness of arginine. So that you know it looks like other uh, you know stickiness scales that you know have you know arginine being sticky and there's this Yuri model that GT Metal recently introduced to, to the condensate field and that's pretty similar to that at least in that aspect it's different from other ones. It's also pretty similar to Hydrophobicity scales scale for membrane proteins because membrane proteins happen to have arginines because you know they interact with you know with with their with their phosphate head groups. So not really because they're hydrophobic, but well maybe because they're hydrophobic, but also because they have these aspects. Um, 
Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think for many of these things, I really think this kind of, you know, top-down data-driven optimization is the way forward uh, for these kind of coarse grain models. Um, but, you know, there is nothing that in principle prevents us from combining it with, you know, bottom-up approaches. It's not easy, but this is what Martini does, sort of combines bottom-up and top-down. And, you know, we've sort of moved it more in the C alpha model to the more top-down. But of course, you know, we could find data on small peptides, uh, you know, and then maybe we could even parameterize a backbone kind of potential. We, we can introduce a backbone potential at the C alpha level, and other people have done this. We've, we've also played around with this. Um, but I think, you know, there's a bunch of ways that this model could be improved. I think the major outstanding thing to test is, you know, the interactions between multiple proteins. Maybe that can break some things. Uh, and then, you know, and then exploring effects of charges, uh, exploring effects of temperature. Um, so, you know, we have temperature independent parameters, but of course these coarse grain models, the parameters should be temperature dependent. Um, so I think this would be another obvious thing to do. And then of course, you know, the other obvious thing to look at are, are nucleic acids. Other people have looked at this and this is something we should also, also look at. But for this model, I think, you know, charge effects and temperature effects would be the sort of the next uh, frontier to uh, to look at, and so we just need you know good data on you know charge you know charge variation, uh, salt effects, uh, temperature dependency uh, on, on on compaction, and of course you know that's where you know, all the nice work from 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 you and Ben and Jad and, and other people would 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 be fantastic tools. And then we have to figure a way of of sticking it in the model without a parameter explosion. I think that's doable. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Creston, for the wonderful talk and everybody for the great discussion, um, particularly you, Creston. And so, um, yeah, this is it for today. I hope um, we see all of you again in three weeks for Helmut Grubmüller. And uh, Creston, thanks again for joining us today. It was a fantastic talk, a great discussion. And um, everybody have a great evening or day, wherever you are. Thanks a lot for coming, everybody. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.